What we're going to talk about this morning is concern for people. Somebody say concern for people. Sometimes we uh, hear so much that uh, the problem is us that we forget that the problem really is not so much us but our lack of concern for other people. Anybody buy that? And uh, so we can really run into that problem and, and kind of get self-focused uh, by trying not to be self-focused. And uh, so we want to talk about concern for people. And, you know, I, I want to tell you as we start out here, one of the great challenges of, of bringing God's Word and, and discipling people and that kind of thing is that oftentimes we come into uh, church, we come into our small groups uh, with an, a totally opposite idea of what it is that God wants to teach us. We, we come in with an upside down idea from what uh, God is about to teach us. And uh, in many cases, it even sounds a little bit the same, what we're believing and what we're about to learn. But uh, in reality, we might see things very differently from, from the way that God sees things. And so there's an adjustment that needs to take place. And what we're talking about when we talk about that is worldview. Somebody say worldview. Worldview is what we're talking about. World, here, here's a short explanation of what a worldview is. Worldviews work in multiple levels in each individual. Every person operates out of a basic set of convictions about reality, truth, meaning, and how the world works. That's worldview. All of us have a worldview that we're working from. All of us have a worldview that causes us to make the decisions that we make and go about things the way that we go about things, including our concern for people, comes out of a worldview that we have. Now, we learned that someplace. We learned our worldview somewhere, or we are learning our worldview someplace. So generally, it falls into one of two categories, generally, I'd say. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different worldviews, but the general worldviews come like this. The, one worldview is what the world has taught us. So we have a worldview based on what the world is teaching us, or we have a worldview based on what God has taught us. So we view the world the way that God is teaching us to see the world. Now, we have one of those views. One way or the other is the way that we view the world and our concern for people and the way that we operate. Um, I read about a, a child who asked his father, for this, this is a worldview example, a child who asked his father, uh, how were people born? And so his father says, well, Adam and Eve made babies, and their babies became adults and, and made babies and so on. And so the child was not real satisfied with that answer, you know, inquiring minds, right? So uh, the child went to uh, her mother, and her mother answered the same question. Only the answer was a little bit different. We were monkeys, and we evolved and, and became like we are now. So the child went back to his father and said, uh, You're a liar. You lied to me. His father replied, No, your mom was talking about her side of the family. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, make no mistake about it, it's difficult I want you to hear this. Somebody say, I'm listening. It's difficult for us to maintain God's point of view. Uh, many of us want to have God's point of view on the world, but it's difficult to maintain it. Think about this for a minute. We show up to church, and many of us show up to church for maybe an hour a week, some of us a couple hours a week, and uh, the rest of the time, day after day, hour after hour, we're pounded with what the world thinks and the way the world thinks. Are you with me? Um, the fact is, we think upside down from the way God thinks. And if we want healthy... How many of you understand that there was only one really healthy person that ever lived? His name was Jesus. <laughs> and generally, we don't think like Jesus thinks. So, you know, we think upside down, God thinks right side up, and we've got to get that flipped somehow. And it's probably not going to happen in an hour a week. Anybody get that? Uh, the, the rest of the time, you think about this, the rest of the time we're inundated with, with what? Music uh, that has a different message than God's music, or, or a different message than God has. We're, we're inundated with news that comes at you just 
right and left. We're inundated with what people say to us. We're, we're pounded with information that just constantly comes at us that's really upside down from the way that God thinks. Concern for people uh, comes from a certain world view. We're going to learn concern for people from the world's perspective or we're going to learn concern for people from God's perspective. Now, as a believer in Christ, some of us might come to faith in Jesus today. Others of us uh, might already have some kind of faith in Jesus. But I have to be intentional as a believer in Jesus Christ. I've got to be intentional about learning and understanding God's worldview. Somehow I've got to get intentional about that. Does that make sense to anybody? Otherwise, I'm going to have a, a world worldview, and it's going to be upside down from God's thinking. Let me, let me give you a case in point. The devil, who's real, uh, has always been a copycat. He's an imitator. In fact, the Bible says that he masquerades as an angel of light. So he's always masquerading and, and, and acting like the things that he presents are good things. For example, we live in a world today that seems to be very interested in having a concern for people. Are you with me? The world in general kind of puts this view out there that, yeah, it's good to have a concern for people. But I want to present to you up front some problems with the way the world has concern for people. How it's upside down, perhaps from God's way of having a concern for people. Let me show you just a few. Um, here's some problems with the way the world has concern for people. Number one, it demands rights for people, but always at the expense of other people. Some of us are on the short end of that stick. The world demands rights out, out of concern for people. The world demands rights for certain people at the expense of others. They call it tolerance, but it's intolerance toward others. Anybody with me? Secondly, I think one of the problems with the way the world has concern for people is this. It, it really has no wisdom in its concern for people. Um, here's what I'm talking about. Uh, people receive help for their circumstance, but they don't receive help for their real problem. That's the kind of concern that the world has for people. In other words, uh, let me fix your immediate situation by throwing money at it or helping you with that immediate situation, but let's not ever look at what caused that. that that's not real concern for people. Anybody get that? But the world has that concern for people. Thirdly, I think... Um, one of the problems with concern for people in the world is this. It, it doesn't understand what love and hate really is. The world doesn't understand and can't understand, shouldn't be expected to understand, what love and hate really are. Instead, it seeks to silence people who actually talk about the problems, the real problems, and, and, and those, those actual problems then become uh, an issue of tolerance, and then we can't even talk about that. They become unmentionable in the world. You can't even mention certain problems now, even though we need to talk about them, because the problem itself is unmentionable. That's the way the world has concern for people. Let's not, let's not mention this issue. Anybody with me? Uh, how many of you understand that you, you become a person who's a bigot if you talk about issues? Is that right? The fourth problem that I see in the way that the world has concern for people is this. It, it's become a way to gain popularity. Every important person has their soapbox. You ever notice that? Everybody's, everybody's adopting somebody. Everybody's adopting a cause. 
So you get popular, and, and, and because they, the, the people that are incredibly uh, celebrity-like don't want to be seen as rich and famous, they adopt a certain cause. And now what happens is concern for people becomes what? It becomes their own cause. It becomes, I want to be seen as, as this person that really cares. Do you know how upside down from God's world that is? Here's how upside down that is. I want to tell you that the biggest heroes in the world are the, the people that nobody knows their name, but they're cleaning a toilet in a church someplace. Those are real heroes. So the world's concern for people is pretty upside down from what God, uh, what God says about concern for people. What, what does God's word say to us about concern for people? How does it differ from the way the world has concern for people. Well, we arrive at Acts chapter 15 in our study of Acts, and we know that the Jerusalem Council is going on, and something really interesting takes place here in the Jerusalem Council. They're deciding, they're, they're trying to fix a controversy that's happened in the church where some people are saying, well, uh, you get saved, you get right with God by uh, Jesus plus doing some other things. And then this other group says, no, 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 it's Jesus alone. And so they go back to Scripture, they go back to what God's Word says, and the judgment is, no, 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 we shouldn't trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, it's Jesus alone. Somebody say, Jesus alone? That's it. Jesus saves. That's it. The, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is all that saves. But now watch this, verse 20. But we should write them, that is all the churches, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. Now watch this, verse 21. Why should we do that? Because from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, uh, his law, the law of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law that's printed in those five books, and he is read every Sabbath, that is, those books are read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So they write to the churches, and when they write to the churches, they say, yeah, it's Jesus alone. Uh, seem good to the Holy Spirit to, to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. So it's Jesus alone, but now there's some requirements. You see it? Somebody say, I see it. Watch this now. That you abstain, that is, you stay away from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you, this is a very important part of the verse. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So what's being said here is this. Yeah, it's Jesus alone that saves. That's it. His sacrifice on the cross. But... If you don't stay away from these things, you're going to really struggle in your relationship with Jesus. It's never going to be everything that it ought to be. Who's getting that? Now, the question is, what are we talking about? What, what, what is it we're supposed to abstain from that really gets in the way of a relationship with God? What's he talking about? Well, there's two basic categories there. And you know, some of you know, we talked about one of them last week. One basic category is there's things that are widely accepted by people. Most people do them, but if you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, it'll really screw you up if you do it. That's sexual immorality. You're going to have a lot of problems if you engage in sexual immorality as a practice in your life. If you don't abstain from that, your relationship with God is never going to be what it could be. You're going to pray for God's power to get you past things and to deal with things and, and to feel God's love and enjoy that, but you're never going to feel it because you're dabbling in sexual immorality. So he says, probably be a good idea. Stay away from that. Fill yourself with God's love instead of the love of somebody else. Quit looking for that. Fill yourself with me first. Maybe I'll give you somebody. Are you with me? So we talked about that last week, but the second category is things that seem like no big deal, but they cause other people to stumble. They cause other people trouble. And so as a believer in Christ, you should be concerned about that because you need to have concern for people. Anybody with me? So we have a bigger world view. We care about people to an extent, when you put your faith in Jesus, you care about people to an extent where you're actually sacrificing some of your own rights and privileges for their sake. It's a different kind of care. It's not about me. It's about them. Anybody getting it? 
Anybody getting it? Awesome. So what you need to notice is this. When he talks about uh, food sacrificed to idols, talks about what's been strangled or blood, those are really cultural items. They're first century issues. In one case, with the, the blood and the strangled food, you know, you're going to upset the Jews if you do that, was his point. You've got to have a concern for them. With the idols and the, stu- and the food that's been sacrificed to idols, one of the practices was that the, the pagan people, the Romans, the Greeks, would bring a sacrifice into their pagan temple, and it would be a meat sacrifice, and they'd set it on the altar. And then after a day or so, nothing happened with it, you know. They'd be, they'd be trying to get their God to love them, trying to get their God to appease them, trying to get their God to give them kids or something like that. And so they'd leave the meat offering on the, on the altar. And after a day or so, they'd take that down to the market because it was just sitting there, and, and they'd sell it. And it'd be sold as day-old meat. So it'd be cheap, and Christians would buy it because Christians were oppressed. Didn't have the money to buy good meat. So they're saying right here, you know what, don't do that because it's probably going to offend people. It's going to cause problems with their faith. It's going to cause an issue with them trying to come to Christ. So here's the point. They're really cultural issues. They're things that, how many of you see that we wouldn't see those issues today? And so when you see an issue in the Bible that's that cultural, that's that related to the first century, what you have to do is you have to... Uh, It doesn't exist any longer, the issue itself, so what we have to take is the broader understanding of it, the broader meaning of it. It's still literal, but we got to go broad. Are you with me? And so here's what you need to think about. Watch this. The instruction, listen, somebody say I'm listening. The instruction to abstain from both food sacrificed to idols and strangled food and blood were not about requirements to be saved. They were not about requirements to be saved. Instead, they were about being a stumbling block to others. They were about care for other people. Do you see it? So that's the broader meaning. Now watch, I'm going to give you a couple of things to get your head around so that we can move on and really understand how this goes with us. Are you ready? All right. These requirements were about concern for other people, about believers uh, making Jesus and the gospel attractive to others at the expense of giving up some of our personal freedoms. Point is, I can eat anything I want, and I'm still saved. Right? There's no food that's unclean. We'll talk about that in a little while, but, but... If it's going to offend somebody, whatever it is, and we're not just talking about food now, whatever it is, I need to give up possibly some of my personal freedoms in order that other people might turn to Jesus. See it? Give you another statement. If you find the secret, here's what he's saying, if you find the secret to caring for others more than your own freedoms or rights, you will do well. As a believer in Christ, you're going to have a really hard time with life and life in Christ if you make everything about you, about your rights. It's going to be uphill both ways. I remember when it first struck me in my life that I didn't listen to other people very well. And I remember that I I had become a Christian. I had put my faith in Jesus. And almost one of the very first convictions was, Lynn, you don't listen to people worth a darn. You always make everything about you. Somehow, Lynn, you manage to make every conversation. Somebody comes up to talk to you about something, and you flip that around, and pretty soon you're talking about yourself. And I hated that bit of conviction that God put on me. Anybody relate to that? It just, it just sucked big time, right? You know. But what really bothered me most about it was I was glad God showed me that, but what bothered me most was how am I going to fix that? I am the most self-centered individual on planet Earth. How am I ever going to fix that? God, I want to talk about me, okay? (laughs) I want to. 
How could I ever get to a place where I cared about others more than myself? That really bothered me. And then, you know, I started spending time in God's Word, and I started to see things in, in the Bible, in Scripture, that really bugged me, really got under my skin. Like, check this one out. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Well, thanks a lot. How am I supposed to do that? That's impossible. I mean, God literally telling you, you're supposed to have more concern for their stuff than yours. So here's what I'm getting at. The question is not whether or not we should be selfish. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? The question is not whether or not we should be selfish. Everybody knows you shouldn't be selfish. That's easy, right? I mean, think about it. It destroys marriages. There's never been a divorce that didn't come out of selfishness. It destroys marriages. You will destroy your children if you are selfish. You'll wonder how they got selfish, and one day you'll look in the mirror and go, ah, crap. It, it destroys, so it, so it destroys our homes, it destroys our friendships, it, it spoils our workplaces. Uh, you know, we're forever talking about how so-and-so in the workplace is such a jerk. <laughs> I wonder how I could improve that. <laughs> You know, it, it creates greed, and even murder. How many of you know murder comes out of selfishness? Everything flows out of, out of selfishness. We, destroy, we literally destroy ourselves with selfishness. There's never been anything that you got into that began to own you that didn't come out of selfishness. And selfishness constantly, constantly, watch this. Somebody say, I'll watch. It constantly, consistently holds you back from a deeper... Um, more powerful relationship with Jesus. So everybody knows they shouldn't be selfish. The question is, how can I not be? Amen? So I'm going to begin to dig into that, and then we're going to look at some things that that means, and I'm going to get you halfway through today, because there's a lot here. And uh, I started out with a couple of notes, and I thought, God, that's some pretty neat thoughts, and I ended up with 14 pages. So you probably don't want to sit through that, and normally I'd just subject you to it anyway, but not today. Uh, so uh, anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll get about halfway through today. Sound like a deal? Everyone knows they shouldn't be selfish. The question is, how can I not be selfish? Now, if you want to make a note about this, and you want to study this deeper, there's three places in the Bible that you're going to go to to understand what God's talking about here. And it's 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 10, and Romans 14. And we're just going to take little bits and pieces out of each of those chapters. 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, and then Romans 14. So first thing we'll do is we'll go to 1 Corinthians 8 to kind of begin to give you the secret of uh, dealing with your selfishness and my selfishness. You ready? Here we go. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 3. Now, concerning food sacrificed or offered to idols, first thing I want you to notice is he's on the same subject. It's that cultural issue of caring about other people, having concern for them more than yourself. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, cool. All right, we know that all of us possess knowledge. You got the quotes around it because it was a popular saying of the time. You know, we have popular sayings of our time. They did then as well, and that was one of them. All of us possess uh, knowledge. This knowledge, though, puffs up, but love builds up. Verse 2, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. And verse 3, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So the first thing that I want you to notice here, here's what he's saying is, understand uh, this is going to require maturity. Understand that uh, getting a handle on, with both hands, getting a handle on uh, your selfishness and then caring about others more than you do yourself is going to require maturity. Somebody say maturity. Uh, getting selfishness under control requires maturity. And so that's what he un kind of uncovers for us here. Three levels, levels of 
maturity. He uses the word knowledge, means maturity. Are you with me? Three levels of maturity or knowledge. The first level is this. It's common knowledge. Common knowledge, meaning that we all have it. And that's exactly what he says, right? All of us possess knowledge. There's a level of maturity that you come to when you realize, you know what? Everybody's got knowledge. I'm nothing special. You get that? Uh, you can go home every day and you can complain about people and you can talk about how much smarter you are than they are, but here's what I want to promise you. They're doing the same thing about you. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody getting that? We all possess knowledge. There's a level of knowledge that we all possess. It's general, common knowledge. We all have that knowledge. Now, as human beings, we are able to obtain knowledge. You can, you can go to the library, you can go look at a video, you can obtain all sorts of knowledge. You can get some self-help to try not to be selfish. Anybody with me? You know what the problem with it is? God's Word says that that kind of knowledge does what? Puffs up. What's that? Pride. Somebody say pride. Pride is never spoken about as a good thing in God's Word. Never. Never. Because you'll never accomplish being proud of yourself and being sacrificial with others at the same time. Never. Pride is never, it wasn't meant to be a good thing. If you believe God's Word is truth as opposed to what the world teaches you, pride is not a good thing. And here's why. God created you to glorify God. Not to have pride in yourself. Do you understand that those are opposite things? You talk about upside down, watch this. Somebody says to you, no, you need to have pride in yourself. No, you don't. You need to, have, uh, uh, you need to love yourself, uh, but love God so much more that everything that you do is about glorifying Him. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Everything that I do. Eating, drinking, whatever I do, I do to the glory of God. I am meant to be a reflection of the glory of God. Do you know that that's why you were created? Why did God create Adam and Eve? So that they could be proud of themselves? So that they could glorify him? So that they could be a reflection of who he is? Now we fail at that, but we need to grow at it. Anybody getting that? So here's the problem. Any worldly knowledge that you get is going to be prideful worldly knowledge. It's going to be stuff you gather that doesn't do you any good except blow you up. You are created to glorify God. Glorifying God is the opposite of pride. Pride is the devil's tool. By the way, original sin, it didn't happen with Adam. It happened with the devil, and it was pride. Ezekiel 28. Secondly, here's the, here's the second level of maturity that he talks about, and that is knowledge, but not as you ought to know. Knowledge, but not as you ought to know. So at this point, I'm gathering some knowledge. I'm, I maybe even know uh, God to some degree. Maybe I've mentioned him in my program, that kind of thing. Anybody with me? But it's not knowledge as I ought to know. First of all, it's still got a lot of pride in it, and so it does some damage. But the biggest thing about this level of maturity is that mostly I want people to know how much I know. So I have knowledge, but what's it driven by? It's driven by the fact that I want people to know that I know something. In other words, my mouth is not controlled uh, by uh, the Holy Spirit. My, my mouth is not controlled by intelligence. My mouth is not controlled by anything except that I want people to know that I know something. So when I get a chance, I'll throw some knowledge. You guys need to hear this. Anybody hearing it? When I get a chance, I'll throw some knowledge out there, but my motive in that is that other people know that I know something. 
So I don't really know as I ought to know. I know, but I don't know as I ought to know. How many of you know that the same information can be given in two completely different ways so that it's accepted totally differently? You hear what I'm saying? I've seen people jump at the opportunity to tell somebody something and it ruined them. They needed to hear what that person said, but it ruined them because it was all about them. There's no selflessness to it. It's all selfish. Anybody hearing me? There are even those who have a knowledge of God, and I'm I'm sure you've run into them. Generally, they carry a giant King James Bible about that big, and you can get a really good grip on it, and then you can just thump somebody with it until they submit. Can you tell they really bug me? That's why I'm getting so big, I'm just going to beat the crap out of them. Anyway, um, the the third, sorry, anyway, the third level of... uh, it's a holy beating, okay? Uh, the, the third level is a godly knowledge. This is the third level of maturity. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, godly knowledge. Godly knowledge develops godly wisdom. Now I want you to get a hold of this. Godly knowledge develops godly wisdom. What does the word wisdom mean? It's different than knowledge. It's not just knowing something. Wisdom means skill for living. The word wisdom is an Old Testament word, a Hebrew word that it's fun to say. You can spit on your neighbor when you say it. Hachma. Anyway, it's, uh, it's great. It's, I just say it. It doesn't mean anything. It's just fun to say. So anyhow, no, really, uh, it, it came from when the craftsmen built the beautiful things in the temple. And people would look at those things that were so ornate and so incredibly made that they knew that that had to have come from God because no human being could do that. And they would say, Hachma, God's wisdom. That became a word that means skill for living. Say that with me. Skill for living. So when you have a godly knowledge, you begin to have a skill for living. It's a third level of maturity. How many of you know we need skill for living? I love God. Notice this. Notice what he says in our text at 1 Corinthians 8 and the third verse. I love God and am known by him. It doesn't say, I know him. It says, I'm known by him. Are you getting the difference there? I love God, and, and, and because I love God, there's an openness to our relationship where I'm not afraid to be known. How many of you understand that as you mature in Christ, one of the things that you do with both God and with people is you're not afraid to be known anymore? You become more and more open to someone knowing you. And the fear, there's fear in that. Because there's stuff in there, right? But you grow into the fact that, that you want to be known. You can't love God apart from being known by God. This is a heart that has a desire to be known. And that can only come out of a regenerated heart. That is a heart that has put its faith in Jesus Christ. A regenerated heart. Now what you need to understand is that, now listen very closely, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about being known by him, but he's on judgment day at that time. And you talk about being scared, listen to this, listen to what happens here. There are people who go to judgment day and they say, listen, Jesus, didn't I do this for you? Didn't I do that for you? And Jesus says, I never knew you. You closed your heart to me and just did stuff for me. That's not being known by God. You see it? I'm growing in an openness to God. That requires communication. For those of you who haven't gotten a hold of this, that requires communication. That requires the kind of communication you would have with the person that you love most. God, this is what happened in my day today. This is how it made me feel. This is how it hurt me. This is the joy I had. Open. That's real relationship. Anybody getting it? This is the level of maturity that it requires to have genuine concern for other people. I want you to make sure you hear that. This is the level of maturity 
that it requires to have genuine concern for other people is to love God and be known by Him. Because when you, be, listen, when you begin to open up your heart, when you begin to open up your heart and have an open relationship with God where He sees everything, you talk about everything, you develop this love relationship with God whereby He develops concern in you. One of those concerns is, is conviction. He'll, he'll begin to, you'll have such open, honest, real communication with Him that you'll be able to sense when you're caring about yourself more than other people. And he'll tell you about it. And, it. and it won't be an hour or two or three later when you can't do anything about it. It's going to be Johnny on the spot. I'm going to do something about it right now. Whoa, whoa, back up, Lynn. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't about you. This is about them. Shut up. Let them talk. Anybody hear me? See, at this level, I'm no longer doing things just to impress people. I'm no longer trying to earn some points with people. I'm not doing bare minimum because nobody's looking. I'm operating out of love. And so what I'll do is I'll actually spend myself. I'll spend myself. And that's not cheap. But I'll spend myself on behalf of other people. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has not seen, cannot love God, whom he has seen. I always looked at that and I thought, what does is, what, is what you can see and not see have to do with each other? <laughs> doesn't make any sense, but, but it does. Think about this. Your love of God, okay, how, how many of you know it's really easy to say, I love God? I, I believe, right? Easy. I mean, that just rolls off my lips like nothing. But what he's saying here is the way that you value what you can see, the way that you value what you can see, your brothers and sisters, are you with me? The way that you value what you can see reflects the way that you value what you can't see. So I can't say, you know what, I love God if I'm not really loving people. Got me up here? Got it? See, most of us would look at that and we'd say, oh, I don't, I don't hate my brother. But the question is, what does it look like to love somebody? What does it look like to really care about somebody? What does it look like to have genuine, godly, biblical concern for people? I want to give you two things. Like I said, we're going to get the other half next week. But I want to give you two things that it means to really care, to really uh, love God and to love others. Are you ready? Number one, you don't have to get love in order to get, uh, give love. You don't have to get love in order to give love. What I mean by that is you don't have to be loved by somebody, like people. You don't have to be loved by people in order to give love to people. If it's a genuine love for God that you have, if you're in this open, loving relationship with God, if you're really loving Him, then you don't have to get love from people in order to uh, give love to people. See, in the world, how many of you understand that love is purely reciprocal? The way the world operates is, if you love me, I'll love you. How many of you have had a relationship that went absolutely bad because it was based on that principle? And they didn't love you right, and what happened? Boom! Right? <laughs> True? Well, see, when we're loving God, when we have a, a love relationship with God, God's point of view is this. What God wants us to do is to be in this relationship with him and enjoy his love so much that we have love to give because it came from him. Let me show you. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 4. Oops, it's not there. It was on the other page. There it is. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Okay, so even our love for God comes from where? From him. You see it? Somebody say from him. Amen. And he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we 
also ought to love one another. We love because he first loved us. How do I care about others more than myself? How can I do that? Well, the first thing is that I must learn to receive the love of God. I must learn to receive the love of God. See, God loves me is not just a nice bumper sticker. <laughs> it's, not a, it's a great catchphrase these days, but it doesn't mean anything if you just have catchphrases. It means nothing. It, it, the truth is, God loves me is a life-altering, transformative truth. It's, uh, it, it, and it can only be accepted through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That comes through uh, faith in Christ. There are a couple of levels of God's love that you need to understand. Uh, in one sense, it's true that God loves people, all people. That's true in one sense. God created everybody. He loves everybody. But God speaks specifically about the fact that he loves his children most and differently. Are you getting that? You say, well, how do I become a child of God? He has a special love for his children. What, what is a child of God? Listen carefully. John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, what's his name? Jesus. All who believed in his name, the name of Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. God has a special, different kind of love for his children. Those who have entered into a real relationship with him put their faith in Jesus, yes? So as a child of God, here's what he's saying. You are enabled to grow in a love relationship with God. You're enabled because he can love you now in a different way. He's able to, uh, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he pours his love out into your heart through the Holy Spirit. So he pours this love out into you, and now you're able to love him in return. So the point is this, a Christian, a believer in Jesus Christ, doesn't love with his or her own love. So those relationships we talked about, they, they're, now it's God's design. Wow, who would have known that he'd know how to have a relationship? Huh. But think about it. Now that relationship is going to be a healthy relationship because she or he doesn't have to love me in order for me to love he or she. Are you with me? See, I have it that I can give now unconditionally because if she doesn't give it to me exactly right, guess what? I've still got God's love to give to her because he's loving me. And guess what? I'm not, I, I'm, he's pouring it into me, he's pouring it into me, he's pouring it into me, but I'm not just a, 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 a giant lake reservoir. I'm a river, and it needs to flow out of me into other people. And I have opportunity to do that all the time. You have opportunity to do that all the time. Notice what he says. Beloved, look at this, where is it at? Uh, I'm lost. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to, somebody say ought to, ought to. love one another. What he's talking about there is uh, authoritative. And what he's saying is this. Um, because I've loved you and poured love into you, you ought to be able to love other people. It's like a little girl who goes to school, and then she comes home and complains, you know, she was supposed to eat hot lunch at school. How come you didn't eat hot lunch at school, mom says. You know, you ought to be able to eat hot lunch. I gave you the money for it. The point is this. God has given you love. You ought to be able to give it. We have it to give. Somebody say, we have it to give. What does it mean to love others? Secondly, it means that your desires are less important than people. And I'm going to finish up with this one. Your desires, what you want, are less important than people. If you really love God and you love others, that's, that's a fact right there. In the world... What I want comes first, yes? Um, Got to look out for number one, amen, right? <laughs> but here's what he says, Romans 14 and verse 13. 
Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Somebody say never. never. Let me help you right off the bat, because many people are going to be glued to the first part of that verse, and, and so, some of you even might have that as a favorite part of your Bible. Don't judge, lest you be judged. Guess what? I'm sorry. That's not what it means. Um, not passing judgment doesn't mean that we don't determine what's right and wrong. It doesn't. In fact, I, I want you to understand that the Bible says at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 that as you mature in Christ, you know more and more about what's right and wrong. Are you with me? How many of you understand you're going to have to make constant determinations about what's right and wrong? That's called judgment. Are you with me? Should I do this? Should I do that? Uh, is this best? Is this best for other people? Is it wrong to agree with this? How should I disagree in a way that doesn't destroy people? I have to make constant judgments. If I don't, I wind up in a pickle all the time in my life. Is that true? Of course it is. So here's what we have to be careful of, though, in regard to that. Now watch this. We're going off from this verse, and notice what he says. Uh, we have to be careful that our opinions don't get in the way. Our opinions, somebody say opinions. Our opinions don't get in the way of others coming to Jesus or following him. See, my, my self-centeredness, the truth is this. My self-centeredness is what most often gets in the way of others following Jesus. I often offend because of my self-centeredness. Now, there's a couple of variables that you need to think about in regard to self-centeredness. First variable is this. Uh, when, you, when you think about offending someone or you look back at offending someone, ask yourself this question. Was it me? What was, it, was it my character? Was it my personality? Was it my timing? Was it my delivery? Was it me that offended? The second variable is this. Was it the gospel that offended? Was it the fact that Jesus died for our sins and raised again the third day? Is that what offended the person? Because it's really easy for me to say, oh, they're offended at me because I'm a Christian. When in fact they might be offended at me because I'm a jerk. It's okay, listen, it's okay to offend with the gospel of Jesus Christ providing you did it with gentleness and respect, and they were purely affected or offended, excuse me, at the gospel itself. But listen, if it's you that offends, then you're in the way of the gospel, even if you're presenting it. The Apostle Paul, you know, he, uh, he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and he said, I've become all things to all people so that by all means I might win some. Here's a guy that... Next to Jesus, second to Jesus, he was probably the toughest guy that ever lived. I want you to get this, especially you guys. I want you to get this. This guy was probably the second toughest guy that ever lived on the face of the planet. You would not want to mess with the Apostle Paul. He would chew you up and spit you out. But you know what he said in that same verse? To the weak, I became weak so that I might win the weak. You know what it means to be strong? Do you have any idea what it means to be strong? What it means to be strong is to lay down your rights so that other people might come to Jesus. It doesn't mean, hey, I'm tough and I'm not going to get run over and nobody's going to mess with me. That's not strong. That's weak. That's easy. Everybody wants that. The question is, are you strong enough to give up some of your rights, your privileges, so that others can come to Christ. Listen, if you guys ever want a relationship with a woman, you better learn to lay down your rights. Because the Bible says this. The Bible says that it's your job to present that woman holy and blameless to God. And that means you lay down a lot of your rights. It's not about your happiness or what they're going to give you. It's about what can I do to make sure that woman is presented to Jesus, holy and blameless. How can I get out of the way? How can I not be a stumbling block to her? I 
I preached something like that one time, and a guy came up to me afterwards, and he said, <laughs> I don't think Jesus took any crap from anybody. And I said, man, that is a misunderstanding of Jesus. Yeah, he was tough. He was Lord tough. Man, he was, he was built for it. You know what I'm saying? He was, probably, he was the strongest man that ever lived. He was the toughest man that ever lived. But guess what he did? He laid down his life so that people would be saved. He, how many of you are hearing me? He gave his life so that people would be saved. And it wasn't just uh, at the cross that he did that. He continually did that through his entire life. Listen, as I close up, I want you to think about this. This is this, this crazy balance that comes as we grow up in Christ. This, this insane, impossible balance that comes as we mature in Jesus Christ. Somebody say, I'm still listening. Still listening. See, on the one hand, you cannot be controlled by what other people think. No, no, no. If I was controlled by what people think, I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying today. You cannot be controlled by what people think, at least not for the sake of personal approval. You, you can't be going around and being so stinking needy and so weak that all you care about is what people think and you're controlled by that constantly. That's not a believer in Christ. You're tougher than that. Anybody with me? You're tougher than that. You've got Jesus. You don't need everybody's approval. But on the other side of that fence, there, you have to care deeply about others and what they think. And, and that's for the sake of acceptance of Christ. You care what they think for the right reasons. You see it? The Bible says that Jesus came not to be served. This is God Almighty. And he came not to be served, but to serve others. We're not here for ourselves. And, and as I finish this up, you know, I want to tell you real quickly that you're, you're going to be in a situation, seriously, within hours, if not minutes, where you have an opportunity to put into practice what you just learned about Jesus right here. And, and what I'm talking about is, look, you care about others more than your own desires. What I'm talking about here is that you don't need to have somebody love you in order for you to love them. You're going to have opportunity to practice this within hours. How many of you know something's going to come at you and it's going to smack you right in the chops just a little bit later? And you're going to have a chance to live for Jesus today. And guess what? The more you practice that and you lean on him, the stronger you're going to be. We're going to ask these guys to come up and we're going to have a last song here, guys. But I want to tell you, this is Baptism Sunday. Both services today, we're going to have uh, baptisms. And uh, during, those, uh, d during this last song, um, give me a chance to explain while I think about what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, this last song, uh, I'm going to be standing over here. Usually I'll just sit through the last song and let you think about what's going on. But uh, during this last song, uh, I'll be standing right over here. What we've got is we've, we've got clothes here. Uh, we've got shorts and we've got T-shirts. If anybody has a sense this morning that you would, you, you, you're getting called to baptism, let me explain baptism very briefly to you. <sighs> baptism doesn't save you. If anybody taught you that, they were a heretic. It's not true. Baptism does not save you. What it is is a symbol of what Jesus has already done for you. Get this picture. Somebody say, I'll get it. Here's the picture. The baptism, we, we dunk you. We put you under the water. The, we don't throw some water on you and call you baptized. Uh, the, the reason that we do that is that the baptistry represents a grave. And that picture is this. Jesus died for our sins, went into the grave, and came out again. Now look, when you do that, You've already been saved. You've already put your faith in Jesus. But what you're doing now is you're saying, I'm a new person and I want everybody to know it. This is my testimony for Jesus Christ. I am a new person because of what Jesus has done for me. 
That's what baptism is. So if you're moved today, we'll baptize you today. As long as you get that understanding of that, we've got the clothes for you here, and uh, we're ready to do that. But you remember, you remember, it's not about just doing something. It's about how you're going to live the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Amen? All right. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to hear your word. God, I pray that uh, your word is effective. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, that if there be anybody here <clears throat> who perhaps has never put their faith in Jesus, that today, God, you are revealing yourself. That's what has to happen, that God reveals himself to you, that you somehow know and see who God is, who Jesus is, uh, in a brand new, clear way, that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, that he is your Lord, and you would put your faith in him. That is, that your faith would no longer be in other things, that you would repent of that, which means to turn to, away from that stuff, and turn to Jesus. Would you put your faith in Jesus today? If so, you start a brand new life. The Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. If anybody be in Christ, would you put your faith in him today? Father, we love you. We thank you, God. Protect what it is that each person is doing today here, the choices they're making. I pray, God, that there would be no just, I know emotion is good, but not just emotion. God, we need to count the cost. We need to know that this is a forever relationship with you. So help us with that, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.